Ciao. Benvenuto al Ristorante di Horatio Mario Gio Co. Or just the, a welcome to the restaurant, if you want to be all boring about it. In this sketch, we'll move forward, or downward, I guess, to discuss diseases of the gallbladder and biliary tract, most of which are caused by stones. We'll see what happens when gallstones play plinko down the biliary tree, causing cholecystitis, cholecolithiasis, and even some of the rarer conditions like gallstone ileus and gallbladder cancer. And what better way to represent gallstones traveling along a green path than a good old-fashioned game of bocce? In this lecture, we'll discuss gallstones and what happens when they get stuck in the biliary tree. In these patient scenarios, you'll see words like colicky, right upper quadrant pain, fever, jaundice, polino, wrinkly, senile, Italian, fools. That's right, friends. We're talking bocce. Gallstones are solidifications of the liquid bile that develop in the gallbladder. See that green outpouching to the left of the bocce court? It's meant to evoke an image of the gallbladder, sending a short cystic duct over to the hepatic duct, thus forming the common bile duct that carries bile to the sphincter of Odi at the duodenum. Usually, we represent gallstones with sea gallstones, like the ones in the back there. In this scene, however, stones are going to take the form of bocce balls, just rolling down that bile tract. Gallstones can be classified by their main ingredient, cholesterol, as in cholesterol stones, or bilirubin, also known as pigmented stones. Cholesterol stones are yellow, kind of like yellow butter, and pigmented stones are black or brown in color. And you should recognize that cute little guy in the back there. It's our recurring and undeniably cute bilirubin billy goat. Aww. Leash and collar if conjugated, off the leash and wreaking havoc if unconjugated. You know the drill. Alas, non tutte lo cembelle riesco noco buco, as they say. Instead of just rolling down the tract, sometimes gallstones get caught, and sometimes they even cause some inflammation. Yeah, these bocce balls are going to be flying all over the place, tripping waiters and injuring patrons. It just wasn't the best place to put a bocce ball court. First, let's head over to Il Ristorante, where our first course will include a quick discussion about what gallstones are and how you even form them in the first place. Starting with cholesterol stones. Just think of your favorite fatty, cheesy Italian dish. Mmm, so much cheese. That feeling of cholesterol coursing through your veins. So good. Well, all that cholesterol has to go somewhere. In a normal, healthy person, cholesterol is stored and processed by the liver before being sent throughout the circulation on those little floaty lipoprotein thingies. VLDL, LDL, and the like. Check out our statins video in Sketchy Farm for a very necessarily steampunk-themed discussion about the normal fate of cholesterol in the body. A small amount of cholesterol, it turns out, is removed from the body as a component of bile. Some of this cholesterol takes the form of bile salts, an amphipathic form of cholesterol that aids fat digestion in the GI tract. Cholesterol is converted to bile salts in the liver via the enzyme 7-alpha-hydroxylase. See the alpha we snuck into the word salt, along with that seven-shaped salt grinder handle? That 7-alpha-hydroxylase converting those cholesterol-shaped noodles into bile salts. This is the rate-limiting enzyme. In the end, the liver excretes both bile salts and just good old-fashioned free cholesterol into the bile. And both end up in the gallbladder. As you can see on our first gallbladder table, even got some free cholesterol noodles on the side there. See? Remember that the bile salts are amphipathic and therefore water-soluble. They help balance out the fat-soluble cholesterol, keeping it in solution. Now, we're missing one more ingredient here. Phosphatidylcholine, or lecithins. So we've thrown in a phosphatidylcholine fork. These molecules help make cholesterol more water-soluble as well. And that's that. All these components just sit around in the gallbladder until... Well, until this happens, I guess. Cholesterol stones form when there's an excessive amount of cholesterol compared to the amount of these soluble bile salts. Cholesterol becomes super saturated and crashes out of solution. One extra large order of cholesterol. Coming right up. How did all of this cholesterol get here, though? Well, there are many risk factors for gallstones, but the classic ones are called the four Fs. Fat, fertile, 40, female. All of which are embodied by our overweight, 
40-something female patron who's obviously had one or multiple past pregnancies. It's easiest to think of these collectively as high estrogen states. Hence the jewelry with our recurring female hormone symbol. As she raises her pudgy finger, demanding yet another order of cholesterol-laden noodles. Notice that she's directing her order over to the liver. This is to remind you that estrogens increase the biosynthesis of cholesterol by upregulating HMG-CoA reductase activity in the liver. That's right. The liver doesn't just process and store cholesterol. It can make its own as well. In this scene, when you think of cholesterol synthesis, think of a gooey pot of cheesy noodle synthesis. And HMG-CoA reductase? Well, just take a look. Horatio Mario and Giovanni and Co. Restaurante for that authentic homemade cholesterol taste. So in summation, fat, fertile, 40 female means more estrogen, which activates cholesterol synthesis, causing more cholesterol to be excreted into bile, and therefore an increased risk of gallstones. All right, instead of cholesterol production, the next mechanism of stone formation involves gallbladder motility. You see that lady over at the takeout window? On her green gallbladder-themed Vespa, those deflated tires represent decreased gallbladder motility, thus promoting bile stasis. Normally, the gallbladder actively reabsorbs water from bile, as depicted by the fluid draining from the bottom of this dilapidated biomobile. Thus, if your gallbladder gets lazy and lets cholesterol sit there and get all concentrated, bam! Campa cavallo calebra crescia. Cholesterol starts to precipitate. There are numerous conditions that result in bile stasis. During pregnancy, for example, gallbladder motility slows due to all that extra progesterone floating around. How about somatostatin analog administration? In the setting of acromegaly, for instance, when you're trying to put a stop to excessive growth hormone activity. Well, turns out somatostatin puts a stop to gallbladder contraction as well. That's not a to-go bag, by the way. That's a TPN bag. Total parenteral nutrition, or TPN, is another risk factor for developing gallstones especially in children. The mechanism is multifactorial, but think of it this way. If you have a catheter sending nutrients straight to the circulation, the GI tract gets kind of bored and sleepy. The gallbladder has no stimulus to contract and voila, bile stasis leading to cholesterol gallstones. All right, it's time to talk briefly about pigment stones, which occur much less frequently than those pesky yellow ones. As we said before, pigmented stones consist primarily of bilirubin, represented by the billy goat in the back there. These stones come in two colors, black and brown. Black stones are made from intravascular hemolysis. Therefore, you should generally consider pigmented stones only in patients with diseases that predispose them to excessive hemolysis, such as hemoglobinopathies, like thalassemias and sickle cell disease, RBC enzyme deficiencies, such as G6PD deficiency, and RBC structural disorders, like hereditary spherocytosis. When RBCs hemolyze, the hemoglobin inside breaks down and eventually forms conjugated bilirubin. Similar to cholesterol stones, too much bilirubin and not enough bile salts will cause the bilirubin to precipitate, forming a pigmented stone. Brown stones, on the other hand, are the result of infection within the biliary tree. See all that inflammation in the biliary bocce court? Bacteria deconjugate bilirubin, so these brown stones are comprised of unconjugated bilirubin, hence the unleashed goat without a collar. I'd say these were just usual goat antics, but look at those beady little goat eyes. He knows what he's doing. Some kind of pre-planned goat vengeance. Finally, and kind of mysteriously, Crohn's disease also increases your risk for gallstones. As we learned earlier in the GI unit, Crohn's is an inflammatory bowel disease that causes cobblestoning and skip lesions throughout the GI tract. So whenever you see skipped areas of cobblestones, think Crohn's. While the mechanism is unclear, it's been shown that patients with Crohn's disease involving the ileum or with surgical resection of the ileum have higher levels of bilirubin in the bile compared to Crohn's patients with the more normal ileum. What the? So we put the cobblestones under the uncoordinated pigmented stone dude. Other mechanisms, such as reduced GI bile salt resorption and decreased gallbladder motility, have also been proposed, but the evidence is not yet conclusive. Whatever the cause, 
stones occur twice as often in patients with Crohn's disease, and they're frequently pigmented. The vast majority of gallstones don't cause any trouble for their owners. When they do cause symptoms, however, the classic presentation consists of waxing and waning right upper quadrant or epigastric pain, typically worse after a large or fatty meal. It's kind of like Bradino over here, right in the middle of that plate of cannolis when that acute epigastric pain sets in. You see, when all those fatty acids reach the duodenum, CCK is released, which stimulates the gallbladder to contract. But if it contracts against a stone lodged in the opening, it can cause some serious pain. This characteristic sensation is known as biliary colic. Colicky pain kind of comes and goes. It intensifies during contraction of the gallbladder against the obstructed duct and resolves if the stone gets unstuck, when it falls back into the gallbladder, in other words. Just think of this colicky collie, retrieving that stone lodged at the outlet of the gallbladder. Pain intensifies as he tugs on that leash and is relieved when he brings that stone back to his owner. The stone pops out and right back into the gallbladder. The pain can also be associated with nausea and vomiting. And now that you mention it, he does look a little queasy, doesn't he? What if the stone doesn't just pop back into the gallbladder, though? What if it gets stuck? I mean, really lodged in there. That's bad. And the symptoms and complications will vary depending on the location of the obstructing stone. So let's start at the origin and work our way down. What happens when a gallstone gets stuck immediately in the gallbladder neck or cystic duct? Well, piovi su bagnato, so to speak. Acute cholecystitis is what you get. K Capelle. It's those frickin' bocce ball players again, isn't it? Acute cholecystitis, or inflammation of the gallbladder, is associated with gallstones 95% of the time and is the most common indication for cholecystectomy. The process begins just like before. Contraction of the gallbladder against a stone obstructed at the gallbladder neck or cystic duct results in the classic symptoms of biliary colic, nausea, and vomiting. But it only gets worse from there. Behind the impacted stone, mucus accumulates and starts making the gallbladder angry. Phospholipases from the mucosa hydrolyze biliary enzymes to form caustic substances, which inflame the mucosa. The inflammation progresses, the gallbladder distends, and intraluminal pressure increases. This leads to compression of the vasculature and gallbladder ischemia, which ultimately progresses to necrosis and even perforation. This process of distension, ischemia, necrosis, and perforation is illustrated here. You've got the protective mother increasing the distension, if you will, as she pushes her son to safety. Next, her son clamps down on that red vascular sleeve of hers. Then comes the ischemia and necrosis, embodied by that rad necrotic skull shirt. Remember, this can even lead to perforation, hence that cool tear in his shirt. This kid is legit. In addition to inflammation, bacterial overgrowth can occur inside the obstructed gallbladder. The usual culprit is E. coli, but Enterococcus, Clostridium, and Bacteroides can also be involved. When these bacteria grow out of hand, peritonitis with rebound tenderness can be seen. This tends to be a rare occurrence and more likely to happen after gallbladder rupture, which is also a rare event. The classic physical exam finding in cholecystitis is Murphy's sign. To perform it, first ask the patient to breathe out completely. Then, with your hand digging into the right upper quadrant, ask the patient to take a deep breath. If the patient yelps, winces, or suddenly pauses breathing during this maneuver, you've managed to press on the inflamed gallbladder and generate a positive Murphy sign. Benfato.